people see you, not see me. God, may they hear you and not hear me. May you have your way here today. It's your name that we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to dive right into it today. Um, really, uh, w- this is the statement. Last week I had a similar statement for James chapter 1. This is James chapter 2. The reality of our faith is perpetually checked in our public display of it. Perpetually checked. That word perpetually, you probably don't use it very much, but it means never ending. It just keeps going. It's perpetual. And, and our faith is perpetually checked in our public display of it. And you go, I don't know, Chris. I don't know really what that means. And, and really what it comes down to is this question. It's a very blunt question. And it's what we see from this book of James. It's really is this. Are you publicly displaying your faith in Jesus or not? It, and it really it's what it is. It's, just a, it's, a, it's a sweet, short question. Are you publicly displaying your faith in Jesus or not? And, and, and maybe you have some reasons that you've told yourself why you're not. And these are, it's very human for us to defend ourselves and explain ourselves away from what we know to be right. And, and this is something that you go, at one point in our life, yeah, I should be doing that. But you told yourself things like, no, I can't. You know, other people are more gifted than that than I am. You know, I'm, an, I'm an introvert. I'm not an extrovert, Chris. You can't ask me to be that, you know. Or maybe you tell yourself things like, you know, it's against the law. I mean, I can't share my faith. You know, where I work, people, I, I could get fired or lose my job. I mean, all these things we tell ourselves why we can't do something so simple, yet so powerful. Are we, are you displaying your faith publicly in Jesus or not? The book of James dives into this question. And I love this graphic again from last week I showed you. It has these dots that are all being connected. And in the book of James, you're going to see a bunch of dots being connected. The book of James is in the New Testament. It's a small book, five chapters, which is perfect for, for our five, five-week sermon series. And this book of James covers a lot of dots. And it's actually the first book of the Bible. And Bible means book of books. James is the first book that I've ever read at, when I was 13 years old. After I became a Christian, I read the book of James, and I loved it. Because I saw dots like this. It talks about trials and troubles. It talks about faith and follow through. It talks about wisdom and wildfire speech. It talks about pride and prejudice. It talks about patience and prayer. All these dots are talked about in the book of James, and they're connected throughout the book. And in chapter 2, we talk about faith and follow through. Faith and follow through. We're going to dive into that today. And, 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 and also, if you missed this from last week, here's a quick overview. The context of the book of James, written by the brother of Jesus. Um, you know, Chris, Jesus had siblings? Yes, he did. Um, you know, I know there are some denominations, like the Catholic Church you know, really believes that once Jesus was born, Mary remained a virgin, and she just was a virgin all of her life. Not, not according to the Bible. The Bible says that her and Joseph got busy, okay? They had kids afterwards and lots of them. And that's okay that they did that. And, and you see that laid out in the Gospels that, they, that Jesus had siblings. And I made a little joke last week too about could you imagine being the sibling of Jesus? Why can't you be more like Jesus? I mean, it would be horrible, okay? So James is the brother of Jesus. And he didn't really get on board the Jesus train at first. You see, his siblings didn't do that. They didn't think he was Messiah. They, didn't really, they thought he was kind of crazy. And it wasn't until the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that they changed. And James most prominently did. James changed. He, he wasn't a, one of the original 12 disciples. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't someone trained in, in, like, you know, how to be a leader. He was just a, just a regular guy, a regular Joe Schmo. but Jesus made a powerful change in his life. So much so that James became the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem after the resurrection. It was James, not Peter or ever one of the 12. It's crazy. James takes that man to a leadership, and he, he really is, he sees his faith as an extension of Judaism, which I totally believe is legit. The Jewish people are waiting for the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And James is like, this makes sense to me. I'm on board. And he's reaching out to primarily Jewish Christians. He writes this book in 49 AD, about 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And then he ends up dying 15 years after there, after that he writes this, a martyr's death. James was sold out for Jesus. Writing to Jewish Christians at this time who were scattered and tempted to adopt a virtual faith reality instead of an authentic faith reality. Chris, what do you mean by that? Well, all of us are tempted to do this every day. 
It wasn't just Jewish Christians back then. It's today, us Gentile Christians or Jewish Christians too, still. A, a, a virtual faith reality is something not real. We make it be something it was never meant to be. Authentic faith reality is something real, genuine, something that is authentic in front of Jesus and in front of others. Now, check this out. You know, the idea of VR is a little theme we're playing with with this reality check thing, and I like it. If you've ever put a VR uh, headset on, it is insane. You put this little thing, this little like Darth Vader mask on your, on, your, on your face, and all of a sudden you're seeing all these things in like real time, and, and then you're hearing, you have little earplugs in, and it manipulates the brain to believe you're in places that you're not at. And it is incredible. It's actually scary having people kind of like walk a plank in their living room, and you see this. If you, I showed some videos last week. If you type in like VR fails, you'll see a billions of them, okay? People who are just making mistakes and hurting themselves all the time. And sometimes we do the same thing, I think, in regards to putting on a VR set faith that is not real. And we have hurting ourselves and hurting those around us. For example, a virtual faith reality says my faith in Jesus is something private that's meant to benefit me personally. There are some reading this, you know, it's in the room right now, and some reading online or, or watching online going, yeah, Chris, that's just truth. Duh. I mean, I don't see what the problem is. My faith in Jesus is a private matter, and it's something meant to benefit me personally. Duh. And you might have actually grown up in a, in a church culture that, that taught you this, that this is what it is. Friends, if you do this, if you believe this, you're taking the VR set and putting it on, and you not even know, maybe not even know you've done it. Chris, I don't know what the problem is. Isn't it a, it's a personal decision? Yes, that is true. You, it's a personal decision to, to say, yes, I want Jesus to come into my life. He's God, I'm not. But this idea of it being private, that's meant for you only, is so a lie from the pit of hell itself. It's not meant. This is not, this is not reality. See, when it comes to an authentic faith reality, that faith says my faith in Jesus is something powerful that's meant to benefit the world. The world. And then the world. You know, you know, Chris, that's too big of a concept. How about this? The world that you live in, your world, your family, your friends, your neighbors, people that you work with, that you shop next to, at whatever store you go to, that's your world. And, and, and it's very strategic, I see, on God's part to, be, to put this amazing hope and power in our lives and spread Christians all over the planet where, where we are really literally all together reaching our world if we would actually focus on the immediate world around us at the very least. Friend, you, your faith is meant for other people, not just for you, but for your kids, your parents, your friends, people you work with. They're meant to see something and they're meant to get a benefit of your faith. Are they seeing it? See, the reality of our faith is perpetually checked in our public display of it. But is it being publicly displayed? If you have your Bibles, go to the book of James chapter 2. And if you don't have a Bible, there you get your phones out, BibleGateway.com, version. If you're watching at home right now, there's a little Bible application in this app thing if you're watching on your computer. And I got a couple names I've been asking the, the booth to give me. Uh, we got Wendy from Missouri watching right now. Hey, Wendy, glad you're here. Okay, good to see you. And just go ahead and get your Bibles out and get used to using it, James chapter 2. And you're going to see in James chapter 2 the, this overall theme of faith and follow-through. But what you do see is two parts. There's two parts, chapter 2. There's one part I want to just throw out there really quick and acknowledge it. The first part is faith and favoritism. Verse 1 says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Now, this is simply saying, stop favoring other people or certain people over other people. Just stop. Stop, stop giving the people who look like you the most attention. Stop giving people who have money you think more attention. Stop trying to make those people happy and, and don't give a crap about what those people think. Lovingly acknowledge all those around you and realize that God puts you in their lives to love them with, a, with the same love that he's given you to all of them. So don't show favoritism. That's what he's saying right there. Boom. Move on. That's part number one of James chapter 2. Number part two, faith and follow through. It says this. After saying don't show favors to people, he says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? This is where it gets real now. 
he's trying to call out something in us Christians. Something in us that says, I don't need to do anything action-oriented. I can just believe in Jesus and be fine, and that's going to be my life. And James is like, no, what good is this faith you have if you don't show it in your life? For those of us who have a, a lens that comes from a religious background, we don't like this. This is something that goes, and, and I want to first say something. All of us in this room and online, everywhere around the world, I believe we all have a lens that we use to look and read the Bible with and see God with. Now, it's, it's not a matter whether your lens is jacked up or wrong or good. Just matter. That, just know that you have one. Acknowledge you have a lens. And he, when, when someone says something, well, that's not biblical, <laughs> I think the word biblical is just a funny word. Because biblical is defined by what your lens thinks is biblical. Now, you could say biblical means I found it in the Bible, sure, but your interpretation is going to be impacted by your lens. Does that make sense? All of us have a lens. Our lens is made and comes from our experiences or our specific experiences with theology or the Bible. If you have a, say, a Catholic religion background, uh, disclaimer really quick, I love, uh, I have Catholics who love Jesus. I, I love Catholics. I think they're brothers and sisters in Christ. I think their doctrine is, is holistically about Jesus, which is awesome. They have some French things that are not. Um, but you might have experienced some religious, um, I don't know, like kind of like some strict rules in your Catholic background. Or maybe your Baptist background had some strict rules. And you read this and go, I don't like this, Chris. I feel uncomfortable. You're, you're a recovering Baptist or recovering Catholic, and you read this and go, I'm scared of it. Because I hear that it's about actions, I think about this. The VR set with Darth Vader, where he's reaching out, and I've, I've actually experienced this. He's reaching out in the VR set, doing a forced choke on you, squeezing your throat, and for some reason, your brain is going, I can feel it. It's amazing, okay, by the way. But it's super scary, and that's what VR does. But you might go, Chris, this is how I feel when I think about, I have to prove my faith. It feels like I don't want to focus on my actions. I just want to believe. I want the freedom of grace, mercy. I don't want this expectation that I have to do something. I get it. But still, the reality of your faith is perpetually checked in your public display of it. And I know it might be hard to wrestle with. I get that. And we're going to walk through the wrestle. We're going to wrestle with it together. In fact, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever heard of the great Paul versus James dilemma? Anybody ever heard of that? The great Paul versus James dilemma. You go, Chris, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, you might be thinking about, I'm talking about Chris Ball, Paul versus LeBron James. And the dilemma about how they just do not like each other, they're against each other all the time. You know, Paul's out right now with an injury, should be back next week, hopefully if they're still in it. These two might even see each other in the playoff cycle this year. And you go, yeah, Chris, it's a big dilemma. They are against each other all the time. Well, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? You might go, well, Chris, the Paul versus James dilemma, you're probably talking about Paul Walker versus James Dean. You know, who's the coolest? Who has the best hair, right? I mean, it's either going to be going to be Paul Walker from Fast and Furious or James Dean, you know, this icon back then. Who's the coolest? I'm going to put the debate to an end right now. Neither, okay? I'm the coolest. Just kidding. Okay, keep going, okay? So you're going to go, Chris, okay, well, what, what about the other James or Paul versus James? It's probably talking about the great mullet debate between Paul McCartney and James Hetfield from Metallica, right? Like who had the best mullet when they both grew them? I'm not talking about that one either, okay? That's not the great Paul versus James, you know, debate or dilemma. I'm actually talking about this one. <laughs> so weird. Th there's actually a huge dilemma between the, uh, the author and apostle Paul and the author and apostle James, who they just, they, they clash. That's what a lot of theologies and, and commentators and, and scholars believe. There's a great dilemma here. Chris, I don't know. Give me an example of this dilemma. How about this? When the Catholic Church split and it became a Protestant church, came, they protested. That's where Protestant comes from. And by the way, the, the, the Protestants, they were led by Martin Luther, not MLK Jr., but the one that, was, that lived about 500, 600 years ago. And Martin Luther was this priest, you know, pastor, person that loved Jesus and, and really did not like all of the action-oriented things that were being pushed, put upon people or pushed on people that he felt were not biblical. In fact, 
when Martin Luther led the Protestant, really that, that, that Reformation away from the Catholic Church, Martin, if you read Luther, he, he hates the book of James. Hates it. It is very, very, like, on his radar. Chris, why would he hate the book of James? He says, Luther says, well, first of all, it only mentions Jesus twice. Don't, he doesn't like that. He, he also, it never mentions the resurrection. Doesn't like that either. Luther says, it's lame, it's dumb, and he would encourage people, don't ever read it. It's ridiculous. Dumb. Now, I want to say this. I think Luther is a brilliant, brilliant man. Brilliant. But even Luther has a lens. And his lens was birthed out of his experience of the Catholic Church. And he was like, middle finger, screw anything that says it's about action over faith. Dilemma. By the way, it still happens today. There are people in this room and online who are, see the dilemma. They, they, they look at Paul, the author, who says, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. Can I get an amen on this one? Amen, right? I mean, we just went through the book of Galatians last series. We read about how Paul said, it's, it's, when it comes to salvation, it's Jesus plus what? And one more time, when it comes to salvation, it's Jesus plus what? Now, now the, the last service is the same thing. I'm not scared of you, friends. I can, I, can he, I can really handle a strong nothing. Okay, here we go. Give me a strong one, one last time. When it comes to salvation, it's Jesus plus? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. I'm not scared of you. That's great, okay? It's Jesus plus nothing. That's it. And, and, and Paul is trying to make this argument because the Jewish, uh, like, like, the Jewish system, those who were becoming Christians within it, felt like they had to still do the Jewish actions and follow the Jewish law, and, and if they didn't, they wouldn't become real Christians. And Paul says, no, it's about Jesus, not about doing stuff. Amen? But yet, the author James says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. <sighs> what? That's the thought. Unless it produces good deeds, a public display of good works, it is dead and useless. Strong words. So what people think is like, well, this is an example, Chris, of the Bible contradicting itself. This is why I don't read it. It's trash. Friends, it's not trash, and I do not believe it's contradicting itself. That would be a dilemma. But I believe that you can move from dilemma to, to dream team here. And when I'm, here's the example. That's true. I get it. You know, when you, uh, when you see Chris Paul and LeBron James, you think dilemma. They don't like each other. They're totally against each other. They play against each other all the time. They don't go together. But yet, if you reference the 2020, 2012 London Olympic Games, you see Paul and LeBron come together. Paul and James come together, and they just become this, like, dream team 2.0 that just do great work together. And they, ex they experience great victory. And that's what can happen if you bring together faith and good deeds, faith and works. See, the reality of our faith is perpetually checked in our display of it. And the question I have for you today, the process is this. How can we make or really move from viewing faith and works as a dilemma to viewing them as a dream team? They're, they're meant to go together and complement one another, like a yin-yang of sorts, in order to bring about a victory worth celebrating. And, and just, I, for today I have a few from dilemma to dream points I want to share. And actually just two to make it quick. And here is the very first one. Number one, James 2, verse 18. This is what he says. He says, now someone may argue some people have faith. Okay? He, he just kind of presents this argument. Some say, oh, they have faith and others have good deeds. But I say, and this is James speaking, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds. And then he says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You're gonna see something in me, in my life, because of my faith, rooted and sourced from my faith. Now, I'm gonna show you a picture right now. And I want you to process it for a moment. I'm a big visual learner, if you don't know that already. I love 
pictures grab my attention. I spent a lot of time throughout the week trying to find a good picture that'll resonate with me first and hopefully with you. This picture, I think, just nails it. I'm going to show you what the picture. I want you to process. So let me know what you think. And I want you to process this question. How do you think, after you see this picture in a moment, how do you think this picture might describe the relationship between faith and works? Here's the picture. How do you think this picture might describe the relationship between faith and works? Now, this is going to be the audience involvement part of the, of the sermon today. Um, go ahead and, and just raise your hand and tell me just how you think this picture might describe the relationship between, between, between faith and works. Go ahead, Chris. Your, okay, your faith should, be, should reflect your works. Your works should reflect your faith. Thank you. Awesome. Anyone else? Yeah. What's that? It's a reflection. Yeah, yeah. Our, 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 our works are a reflection of our faith. Okay, good. Yeah, back there. She has faith. There's no alligator in the water. That's good. That's good. There's other parts of this thing. I mean, last service came up with a lot of different elements too. Anything else that you see in there? Yeah, the back. Yeah, she believes there's water. She may not know how deep it is until she actually tests it and, t- and, and kind of tests it out. Good. Anyone else? Yeah, God's light and reflected in the water. Good job. I like that part too. Anything else you see in there? How does this picture describe the relationship between faith and works? Again, I don't think it's a, a dilemma. I think it's actually a dream team. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she thought it was. Maybe she thought part of it was frozen, so she's testing right now to see if it's uh, able to be walked upon. You know, so she's bending down and kind of touching it. That's good. Anything else? In the back, last one. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Maybe she touches it, she causes a ripple. I like that. That's good. That's good. Anybody online? Yeah? I see that hand. Awesome. I can't hear you, though. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. I love you, though. All right, here we go. We'll keep going. So uh, both faith and good deeds or works are represented in this picture, I believe. Faith is the woman pointing out the water, and good deeds is the, re- is the reflection of the woman. You see, our good deeds are the reflection of our faith. And neither our faith nor our good deeds would ever be seen or captured by anyone if it wasn't for the light of the sun. Jesus reveals our faith to us. And he uses our good deeds to reveal him to the world around us. And one more. There would be no reflection of the woman if the woman never showed up. Just like there would be no good deeds if our faith never showed up. Both are real. Both are needed in order for the world to see Jesus in us. Does that make sense? Now, remember, I want to remind you of this. There's a similarity and a difference between the two typifications. This is going to be a little deep right now. For those in the room or online that love, like, deep theology, you're going to get a taste of it right now just with a few of these words. There's a similarity and a difference between the two typifications. And what are the two typifications? The two typifications that, that deal with this, that often make its way into the, Paul's writings and this whole idea of salvation is justification and sanctification. These are two deep theology words. The two typifications when you're mapped out is this. Justification is Jesus plus nothing. Sanctification is Jesus equals something. Let me explain. When justification starts with salvation, the the whole subject of how how are you and I saved? We are saved by what Jesus has done for us, not what we've done for ourselves. Can I get an amen on that? Okay, that's justification. Jesus has justified us. He's made us right, another way of saying justified, by what he's done, not what we do for ourselves. Can I get amen again on that one? Okay, so justification is, is Jesus plus what? Okay, you guys are, I'm, I'm losing you now, okay. I, I want the strong, courageous people to say the word that's on the screen. You got this, okay, here we go. Okay, justification is Jesus plus? Nothing. Yeah, it's Jesus plus nothing. That's how we are justified. 
And then once we are saved, we move into a new word, sanctification. Sanctification means the process of being made holy. This process is something non-linear and linear at the same time. Because that's confusing, you lost me, okay? Linear is in order, A to Z. That's how we think usually as humans, especially in the Western world. Non-linear is, I don't need to have a, a, an order here. I can just, I can, something can happen in the, in the real time, real moment. So what I mean by that is this. When Jesus saves us, when you say yes to Jesus, you and I are sanctified immediately. Can I get amen on that? We are made holy. Chris, how do you know? Because being made holy allows us to enter into God's presence. That's important. We are perfect in God's eyes because of what God the Son has done for all of humanity. And when you say yes to Jesus, you get that perfection. Can I get an amen on that one? So sanctification happens right now because of Jesus. It also happens something linear over a lifetime as you and I make our prize be, our goal in life be, to be like Jesus. Does that make sense? Because you don't become like Jesus the moment you say yes to him. You got crap you got to work out. <laughs> you know you do. I know I do. And you're still working crap out, right? That's just normal. That's totally normal. Sanctification is something that happens now and over a period of time. The process of becoming holy. These are the two words that are in dilemma. It's, it's not just Paul versus James. It's this idea of justification over sanctification. But they're, they're similar in that the same thing that you see on the screen, what's the similarity here? You see, anyone guess? It's the word in yellow. Jesus is the similarity. The difference is this. When it comes to our salvation, it's Jesus plus what now? Nothing. Nothing. But once you say yes to Jesus, it's Jesus equals what? Something. something. It equals something. Our faith should equal something. It should produce something in our lives. It's the next step. And here's how I would really phrase point number one. Remember, there's a sim and a diff between the two typifications. The sim is Jesus, and the diff is where you start the conversation. If the conversation is about how am I saved, it is justification by Jesus plus nothing. If the conversation is what do I do after I'm saved, sanctification. Jesus equals something. Does that make sense? We are not saved by our actions. We are not saved by our good deeds. We are saved because we're justified by Christ. And by what he's done in our life, it becomes this, this source, this, this spring that wells up in us. And it becomes a stream that produces action and good deeds. Amen? Now, the reality of your faith is blank checked in your blank blank of it. Anyone give me the first blank? Yeah? Perpetually. Good job. That's a weird word. Perpetually means never ending. Anyone give me the second display, the second little uh, blank there? I just actually said, yeah, it's, it's actually public. Good job. And then the last word is, is what? Display. So now we're going to say it all out together. The reality of your faith is perpetually checked in your public display of it. This is something that you and I have to, I think, process today. That our, our faith is being perpetually forever checked in our public display of it. And we're talking today again, how can we move from viewing faith and works as a dilemma to viewing them as a dream team of sorts? And here is your dilemma, from dilemma to dream point two. Last point. Unless faith, and this is, I want to go to the next verse here. This is verse 17. Unless faith produces good deeds, James says, process this. It is dead and useless. What? Yeah. He goes, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Now that we've already crossed the two typifications, we've already figured out justification and sanctification, we've gotten through that theological dilemma. Now we're seeing, okay, he's saying something very blunt here. Faith without good deeds is dead and useless. Whenever I read scripture, and I want to encourage you to read it too, if you read it, if you see certain words pop up more than once, circle them. Dead comes up three times. Useless also grabs my attention. That's, 
I mean, it makes me think, like, like almost this question, hopefully it makes you think too. So my faith is supposed to be used for something? That's where it should go. If you hear him say, your faith is useless without good deeds, you shouldn't just be offended or defensive. Go, well, my, is it supposed to be used for something? Yes. The VR set that you've been living with says, no, it's about you. It's about you feeling good. It's your private faith. It's you and Jesus. He's your buddy. Keep on living the way you live. He's got you. Friend, take off the VR set and realize it's not about you. And all the love I can muster that Rick Warren says in his book, it's not about you. It's about something bigger. Now, I want you to look at another powerful, instead of a picture, video this time. Now, again, I, I try to find these videos that I think will be powerful, just like pictures, that will express something specific. And I want to share with you this video I think will encourage you. But just like the picture before, you're going to have to process it. Especially right now, and this is, if you're feeling convicted by reading this right here, and you go, Chris, I think my faith might be dead. Don't say it out loud. Just process it. If you think your faith is dead, or if you think it's maybe just passed out, at the very least, and you think, Chris, I don't know what to do. I just feel guilty. Stop. I don't want you living in that guilt land, okay? Shame is horrible. Guilt is supposed to kind of motivate us with some kind of, like, the kind of awakening. Hopefully you have an awakening here you can move forward. But this, if you're feeling guilty by this, I have a video that I think will encourage you. This video is very powerful. Um, it's very encouraging. It's super serious, and I think it'll really grab your heart. And by the way, when I said super serious, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That guy might not call us. I can't believe you called me a psycho. Hey, were you in there just now? You are a psycho. Good God. And comb your hair. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say you did much better. Thought you were so cool. Watch and learn, he says. Well, I was watching. You know what I saw? <laughs> No way that just happened. My car is completely destroyed. I swear I've seen a lot of stuff in my life, but that was awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry about your car, man. <laughs> Give it for the Tommy Boy clip, yes! Now, again, it's not so serious, but I do want to have some audience participation here, okay? Tell me now, right now, how you think I'll just get a couple people. How do you think this video could be an encouragement for you or anyone who might be feeling that their faith might be dead or possibly passed out? And again, if you don't know the video or the movie, Farley and Spade, they hit this deer and they're like, they, they think they killed it. They feel bad leaving it there, so they just throw it in the back seat of their car. And they're, and they're just like, well, we'll deal with it later. And then all of a sudden they're driving along and it just, it just wakes up and just tears things apart. So anyone want to tell me how this video might be an encouragement to you? Go. Oh, yeah, wow. I'm really landing it right now. That's good. So, yeah. I see all the hands online. Wait. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just like, the, just like they thought the deer was dead, uh, you might think your faith is dead, but it can come alive at any second. Good job. I love that one. Anyone else? One more. <laughs> the, the, the deer proved he was alive by all the damage he did, okay, all the work that he did. That's good. There was a lot of damage done, a lot of damage. So much so they were like, I, he's like, probably like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> so it was awesome. Yeah? Anything else? Good. And here's the thing. I think about you, you and I, and I think there's a couple things when it comes to our faith. We might be thinking it's maybe dead. We might think it's, it's, maybe it's just, it's maybe it's passed out. But I want you to know Jesus can resurrect your faith and he can wake it up too. He can resurrect it and wake it up. He is, the, he is the source 
the person who can. And, and if you and I, and I know you go, Chris, that's something like a cute little message. You're, not, you're missing the point. What we're tempted to do is to go, okay, I feel guilty about my faith and my, and my actions not being, you know, very, you know, yin-yangy. I, I, I feel like my faith is kind of dead. And so then you, you, you tell yourself, well, I don't want to feel guilty anymore, so I'm going to do something, which falls under the banner of action and good works. Friend, that's a mistake. You don't start with doing an action. And, and here's another thing, too. In the Christian world, and there's amazing Catholic authors just over the, over just the last, like, you know, thousand years, and I, I read a lot of them during my, 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 my schooling, but it was incredible that, to see this, this debate. The Paul versus James of dilemma is also expressed in another way. It's called contemplation versus action. It's another big theological dilemma. Here's, the, the, here's what it is. Contemplation is you and I uh, not meditating but giving time to just connect to Jesus, the source. He is the source of living water, of bread, of life, all these things that we see in the Bible. Contemplating is making time to connect with Jesus, who we say is alive, and we connect with him and contemplate with him. And then in that spring comes a stream that leads into what's called action. The danger with Christians over, I think, the last 2,000 years is that they choose one over the other and do not even look at the other. And primarily, I believe, in the American culture, we choose action over contemplation. So we'd rather just stay busy and have no idea where the hell we're going. We're like a ship, you know, a sailboat. Full mass. I mean, it's just, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, the wind is blowing and we're going great in our lives. And someone asks us on the deck, hey, where are we going? I don't know, but we're making good time. We have no rudder, no direction. Because we have bypassed the contemplation and going to the spring of life. Friends, you must go to the spring first, I believe. And then it must lead to a stream. So if you are feeling guilty about your faith being just kind of dead or passed out, don't start doing something. Simply just be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Simply just connect with the almighty God who you believe is alive. And ask him to give you direction what to do next. And he will. Now, remember... Only Jesus can resurrect your faith and remind you why your world needs to see it. There's two parts to this last point. I'll just give it to you right now. You might need both today. You might be a re- need a resurrection of your faith and you might need a reminder of your why today. Why your faith matters because you've just forgotten it. You've been wearing the VR sets too long. In fact, you're... Faith might be dead or asleep because you have forgotten your why. As a winter storm rolled into Burlington, Alabama on January 28, 2014, Dr. Zinko Harnke heard that a patient at Trinity Medical Center had taken a turn for the worse. The patient needed surgery ASAP. No other surgeon was available. The patient had a 90% chance of dying. Driving wasn't an option because of the snow and the ice. Emergency personnel were busy, and they couldn't handle it. So there was no way of getting there by driving. It was an unusual storm that just wrecked Alabama. So the 62-year-old doctor faced these brute facts and proceeded to take action. He put a coat over his hospital scrubs and started walking six miles. Chris, what's the big deal? (laughs) In the snow from Brockwood Medical Center to Trinity Medical Center. Along the way, he fell multiple times, rolled down a hill or two, got back up each time. He even helped some drivers who were stuck in the snow. He finally arrived at Trinity, performed the surgery, and saved a patient's life. In a later press conference that praised his efforts, Dr. Zinko, um, Zinko Harnke wondered what all the fuss was about. They're like, doctor, I mean, this is amazing. You did, we heard the story, oh my gosh. And he's like, what's the big deal? He says, it's not a big deal at all. 
He said, any, doc, any good doctor would have done the same thing I did. The doctor said the patient was dying, and he said, that wasn't going to happen on my shift. But a hospital official, doctor uh, really that knew about the story, he went a step further. He stepped in. He's the CEO of Trinity Medical. And he actually was interviewed, and he said this. It's actually, it was not just a walk in the park for the doctor. Given the conditions, the temperatures, and the terrain, it's a remarkable physical feat and a mental feat that he made it. And we have an individual alive today who wouldn't be here if it weren't for his efforts. That's the story. I love how the doctor goes, what's the big deal? It just it, anyone would do that. And what he's modeling is like he has a deep faith in what he's doing. And he's like, I'm here to help people. Duh. A storm gets in the way. I don't care. I'm going to go. Anyone would do that. And that's the action. And, and it's, it's working together. And you and I... <sighs> You know, you might, you, you might feel, well, Chris, what is, well, how does it apply to me? See, even in the midst of the storm, this doctor still remembered his why. He was there to help bring healing to those who were hurting around him. Are you clear, friend, on what your why is? Friend, it's the same. You are here on this planet. <laughs> you are here on this planet. And this is something I battled with in my, in, my, in my 20s. I wanted a good answer. I'm going to give you my answer, okay? You can figure out your own answer in your own words. But if you ever ask yourself, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? The purpose of life is not to get married someday. The purpose of life is not to retire super well. The purpose of life isn't to have babies. The purpose of life isn't to have a great career. The purpose of life isn't to be a good person. In my opinion, from what I see in life, the purpose of life is to glorify God and expand his kingdom. That's it. And you and I don't need money, title, fame, the most popular person award in order to do that. And that's the beauty of this incredible purpose in life. It's found in a relationship with God that, that's, that's experienced with others. The purpose of life, I, I see it modeled in this story of this doctor. He just has a, 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 a just a, a conviction that I'm, I'm here to do something. And you and I are here to do something too. To show people how good God is. To bring healing to those who are hurting by pointing them to Jesus Christ. Friend, I'm telling you, the dilemma to dream point number two. Remember, only Jesus can resurrect your faith. You got to go to the spring and remind you why your world needs to see it. Because there are people dying in your life. And you go, Chris, they look fine to me, but if you spent time with them, you'd see they're dying. They're hurting. They're losing hope. Our world is so jacked up. Jacked up. And I, and I, I understand there, there's, a, there's a strong belief that our world's gotten worse. I get that. But do you know it was, people used labels a thousand years ago too. People used labels like Catholic and Protestant. People got caught up in drama, politics. Just like they did years ago. It's, it's, it hasn't changed, guys. People are people, and they're still hurting. And the only answer is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the only way they're going to see it or hear it is with you. So you know the prayer I pray whenever I, whenever I preach every Sunday? You know what it is, right? God, please, would you just speak through me? May they see you, not see me. May they hear you and not hear me. Friend, what if you made that your prayer? before you go into work tomorrow? What if you made that your prayer before you walked into your home after a busy day? And then, and then I, I understand, I understand. Part of the dilemma, when you think about it, you go, Chris, I, I, you know, this, this works and faith thing, I don't even know what to do. I don't know what to do. How, what, what, what should I do? Should, should I join a small group, start giving more, and, be, and stop cussing so much? Friends, stop it. Just stop jumping over to the action lane. You, you know what you do? You go back to Jesus, and you watch how Jesus interacted with people in his word. And you see, and you, you take your cues from Jesus. You love the way he loved. You serve the way he served. You give the way he gave and gives. You listen the way he listens. If you're looking for a model, don't overcomplicate it. The model who's going to give you direction on what to do in your life has already been provided for you. His name is Jesus Christ. 
And he's available to, for you to connect with every day because of what he's done for you on the cross, how you and I have been justified. See, are you ready to move from viewing faith and works as a dilemma to viewing them as a dream team? Because when you do, when you see the yin-yang of sorts of faith and works, you'll see the dream team come together and you'll see the victory in Christ. Not just the personal victory that you've overcome because of Jesus. And I wanna, I, I'm sorry to, to make light of that because I know it's a big deal. I know. I, I know that the victory that you experience in Christ is a big deal. It, it, it was for me. My annoyance with that phrase comes from when we put on the VR sets and go, oh, I got my victory. Got my victory. Woo! That's my annoyance. Your victory needs to be celebrated <laughs> as you walk into a life of sanctification, looking like Jesus more and more every day. And you're celebrating that victory that's found in him by displaying that victory in front of others. Not bragging, not Bible beating, but loving like Jesus, listening like Jesus, encouraging like Jesus. And remember the reality of your faith is perpetually checked in your public display of it. So friend, start publicly displaying it. Let's pray. God, we love you and we need you and we're sorry, God. Please forgive us for believing this faith thing is private only. Forgive us, God, for, for just making it be about us and what you've done in our lives and what you can still do and forgetting about the people around us who are dying, our kids who are hurting, our parents who are hurting, our coworkers who are struggling, our friends who are just lost, our neighbors who are just have no, no, no direction. Forgive us, God, for just telling ourselves it's not our business. It's not our gift. Forgive us for talking ourselves out of it every day and saying, well, we shouldn't. We might be penalized because of it. Oh God, help us today to see the dream team between our faith in you and the good works that you planned for us to do. The simple yet powerful work of just loving people the way you loved us serving them the way you serve us, giving the way you give to us. So please help us, God. Help us to do that today. In your name we pray, amen. In this moment of communion, guess what you get? What I get? An opportunity for contemplation. Yeah. That's why we do this. That's why we don't send you out of here with stuff to do. You get to be rooted in a moment of contemplation where you go to the spring and connect with the Lord. And then from that moment of contemplation, you ask God to come in. You, you, you ask him for forgiveness, for healing, for direction, and you let him lead you with that stream of action. You're gonna be invited in a moment to go get your communion packets, the wafer symbolic of his body broken, the juice symbolic of his blood shed. Take a moment and just with this communion, and just thank him for his sacrifice and ask him to help you publicly display your faith today. And I'll have a friend over there you can pray with and I'll, I'll be over here and I'll pray with you as well and we'll encourage you. Enjoy your time with the Lord. You're invited to go get your, your little packets.